Good morning and welcome to the pier. We are so thankful that you are with us this morning. We are looking forward to worshiping together through song, through prayer, and through God's word. So welcome to the pier. We're so glad you're with us. I'm sure this week, for most of us, it's been a week where we have been mourning with the news of the remains of being found of 215 children. 215 children found um, at a former residential school in British Columbia. And I'm sure we are all just, as I said, reeling with this confusion and trying to get our minds around this. And it's hard to think about 150,000 Indigenous children being taken from their homes and placed in institutions that were run by the church and funded by our government. Um, and so what I was just thinking about this grief series, actually, that we went through. And I know a lot of us are feeling grief. A lot of us are mourning. A lot of us are confused and we believe that it's a time to listen, and a time to learn, and a time to lament. And so one of our BIC pastors, actually, from the Meeting House, wrote a beautiful prayer this week. And we are going to pray that prayer now together in solidarity and in remembrance of these 215 children. And after I am done praying, we are just going to take a few moments of silence. Jesus, our hearts are so heavy. Our hearts are heavy because lives were lost in an unjust way. Our hearts are heavy because lives were stolen. A history has been stolen, and it didn't need to be. We invite your spirit into this space where we don't have words. We're still processing and learning and grieving. Jesus, by your spirit, will you be so present? Be a presence of peace for our, for our indigenous friends, neighbors, and family. Jesus, would you, by your spirit, move us as the church into a space of compassion, lament, and action? Would you be the one to reveal what our next steps need to be as we sit with the news that once again reminds us of a history in an ongoing system of abuse, power, and systemic racism? We look to you to be the one that leads us. Hear our hearts cry, that we long for it to be here on earth as it is in heaven. And we know that as people who follow you, our role is to be kingdom bringers. Where there is darkness and where there is evil, equip us for that to be the light in dark places. We pray against and we renounce systems of evil that have existed for so long. Jesus, you are the one that leads us and we look to you in a space where we don't know quite what to do. Come and be very near in this moment, we pray. Amen. Ask me to be your friend. You ask me to be your 
of all that you've done in our lives, whether the, we've gone through good times, bad times, ugly times, God, you have always been constant. Your words have always stayed true. Your love has always lasted. And so God, I pray that as we go to hear from your words, your true words, your loving words, God, that our hearts will be open, our minds will be receptive. 
God, and, and we will remember what you've done in our lives. Pray this in the mighty and the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Well, good morning, Pure Family. It's great to be here with you this morning. I'm really glad to be able to speak to you this way and for us to be together, the time of worship. And I thank Pastor Heather for the beautiful prayer earlier. Um, just this is a time for us to bring everything before God, including our mourning, including our grief, and even our anger. So I'm glad that we can have that safe space to do that this morning. And I think it brings to mind the importance of authenticity, uh, sorry, authenticity in community and of being a safe community. And today, that's really what I want to speak about, the importance of community. Because as you know, we are in the middle of a series called The Gift, The Spirit, and The Church. And we're actually into week six. We're going to have eight weeks, and this is week six in our series. We've learned quite a bit. We've had a chance to talk about quite a lot. So I think we're in a place now to survey and to, to take stock of what we've learned, to kind of see what maybe the Spirit wants to say to us here and now in our context, in what's going on right now, this, this space when we're in, still in a pandemic, but things are starting to change as we go through these stages. This is a chance for the Spirit to speak to us. And what I'm going to say today, the message that I have, I want you to know that it's very much for myself, <laughs> as well as anyone else who kind of thinks like me. <laughs> so I have a feeling that you're going to be able to relate to this, but I just wanted to have that disclaimer <laughs> ahead of time, that this is a reminder for myself just as much as anyone else. So what I wanted to bring up first, there's a quote that I kind of keep going back to that I've mentioned before in our series, and it's from David Diego, and here's what it says. In every aspect of its life, and in the overall corporate form of its life, the church is the Spirit's attempt to say something, to get something across, to make a point. The Spirit is trying to communicate through the church. And if the, if the Spirit's trying to communicate, then that's important <laughs> for us to realize. And I think that means that we probably have a bit of work to do in some areas. And one area that I want to talk about today would be in the area of how we envision or imagine or understand ourselves in relation to community. How we imagine me in relation to community. So that's what I want to talk about today. And I would frame it this way to start out. I think we've got a bit of a job to do in terms of balancing out maybe the individualism that we tend to default to. Balancing it back out a little bit more towards placing importance on community. So that's just kind of prefacing it in general. But let me start here to get a little bit more specific. Because what I'm talking about, I think, really goes down to the core in terms of thinking about, you know, the big question, who am I? That big existential question that we all ask at certain points in our life, some more than others, but a very important question. Because I think in our time, in our culture, in North America, how we go about answering that question, how we frame it, is in terms of like a personal project, an independent personal project that each of us are on to define who we are. If we put it more in the context of social media and that sort of thing, we might say that it's a personal branding project. But that personal branding project, I think, you know, in terms of how community relates to it, community plays a very minimal role. And the role that it does play, it kind of just circles back into, again, it being about my project. Here's what I mean by that. If community factors into my project, it's because I've decided to let it, first and foremost. And then secondly, you know, the community that will influence me or impact me I'm going to be the one to decide that, and I'll decide on it based on whether it already fits into my project. So, and that's what I mean by community, just really kind of circles back into it being about my project. And 
don't get me wrong. I think that historically, the pendulum kind of needed to swing that way. It needed to swing toward the importance of the individual. I mean, I think that it needed to swing toward these ideas of us all valuing freedom of thought, freedom of conscience. It needed to swing that way so that we all know that we shouldn't be putting each other in a mold. And so that we treasure diversity as something that's priceless. But what I'm trying to say today is that the pendulum has just kind of swung a little bit too far. And what I want us to think about is how do we balance it out, keeping those truths, keeping the things that we've learned, but bring back in and have a healthier attitude toward community. And I know that this isn't a like extreme thing, a black and white thing, where as if, you know, we're all in one category, we're hyper individualistic or anything like that. And I know for us, you know, those who are watching, it wouldn't be that way. But it's bound to have an influence. And let me give you an example from my life, a way that this kind of personal project approach has impacted me. I think back to my 20s. And in my 20s, I was all about music. For me, my project was to become the best guitarist that I could be, the best musician I could be. And I can remember consciously making the decision to start sacrificing relationships in order to achieve that. I can remember thinking, okay, I need to practice more, so it's okay that I don't have as much time to hang out with my friends, to see my family, and that sort of thing. So I let community take the sacrifice or get sacrificed for my personal project. And if I think back, I remember that there was lots of examples that I could draw from of other people who I looked up to who were doing the same thing or who had done the same thing. So really, to me, that was just the norm. That's just kind of community is the casualty of my project, so to speak. And I think that within the church, I've seen that this has had an influence as well. It's had the had, uh, influence at this level. You know what I mean? It's like we kind of, the personal project becomes the priority when it comes to our church life. If we, it shows up in the way of like, okay, I will prioritize church as long as it fits into that project. And I'm going to go to the church that fits the project, so to speak. And, and if the church stops fitting with it, then I'm going to stop going there and go somewhere else. And again, this is preaching just as much to me. I'm try this isn't meant to sound judgmental at all because I think the thing is, we might not even realize it. I don't think it's something that we're maybe even aware of. It's just kind of gone so deep, <laughs> so to speak. I can give another example from my own life so you know what I mean. Again, I can remember back to my 20s. My personal project was that music thing. And I can remember being part of a great church that was very loving and I was serving there. Things were great. But I decided to leave that church and go to a different one. And in hindsight, if I'm being honest with myself, I left because that new church served my personal project. The new church, there was more opportunity to meet musicians, to do music things, and all of that. It was really exciting what was going on there. But at the time, I don't think I was aware of that. At the time, I kind of spiritualized it. I thought that, you know what, no, this is the right place for me to go. There's an opportunity for ministry here and all that. But if I'm looking back, I'm being honest with myself. I made the move because the new one suited my personal project. So that's what I'm saying. I'm not judging anybody here. But I think the question for us today, drawing from our series, is what's closer to the truth for a follower of Jesus? What's closer to the truth for someone who is trying to live by the Spirit? Well, to start answering that question, I say we start with the one who started it all. In other words, let's start with God. <laughs> let's start with the Trinity. Because there's a really great line of thought in Christian theology right now that says, actually, the Trinity is our model for thinking about community, thinking about our own identity, thinking about who am I? So let's think about that for a second. We don't need to get complicated here in talking about it. And, you know, if you're interested in digging a bit deeper, we did in our Christianity 101 series, we talked about the Trinity in more detail. But for today, let's just think about it quickly here. What's the Trinity? Is the Trinity 
one isolated, independent individual who's on a project? No, the Trinity is three and one. And within the three persons of the Trinity, is there one person who's kind of the, the most important and the others are there to kind of serve that one person's project? No, not at all. The Trinity is three persons who are eternally in a self-giving, loving relationship that's always open to each other and actually that's open to creation as well. So what that says is that God's identity, God's like core to who God is, is relationship, is community. That's really important. That's kind of one of those mind-blowing thoughts when you think about it. And if we're created in God's image, then that means there's something there to learn about our own identities, about our own, like what we were created for and what we need, what we ultimately desire. It tells us that community is way more central maybe than we realize, that relationships are way more core to who I am than we realize. Uh, there's a book that I'm drawing from for this. It's called The Missional Church in Perspective. And it's written by Craig Van Gelder and Dwight J. Gile. I hope I'm pronouncing his last name right. But they say this, if we look at the Trinity, we realize that for us, to be is to belong in community. We are defined by our relationships. At the end of the day, we aren't as isolated and as independent as we think we are. We are heavily influenced down to the core by our relationships. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense, right? Before we learn to speak and walk and even start thinking about who we are, we're so impacted by our parents, our family, and then growing up, our friends, our town, our culture, our country, all of that really factors in to who I am, influencing it greatly. And I influence others as well along the way. And so I am who I am because of my relationships. And if we want to draw from psychology a bit, I've done enough study in social psychology to know that this is a major theme. The theme is that actually things that are very core to who we are, our values, our beliefs, kind of the way we view the world even, the likes and dislikes, it's impacted, influenced heavily by those that we care about. Without even realizing it, people influence drastically <laughs> our values and those things that are pretty core to who we are. So that tells us that I think we need to bring the pendulum then back a little bit from this over-focus on individualism and moving it towards community again, but while holding on to all the things that we've learned <laughs> by going there. Let me give you an illustration. Okay, it's from the sports world. My wife, Randy, and I, we've become pretty big fans of Formula One racing. It's something that I never thought I would get into. But there's this special on Netflix, and uh, it kind of takes you behind the scenes in F1 racing. And it's really well done. It really creates, like, the drama. It shows you all that's going on behind the scenes, and then it follows the races through the season. So because of that, Randy and I have also, we've downloaded an app. We're watching the Formula One races themselves. And the reason I bring that up as an example is if you watch Formula One from the outside, you might think that it's the perfect example of our culture, like the kind of like, you know, it's all about the driver and their pursuit to become the champion and to get there on that podium as number one, right? So it's just everything's about that person's project. But actually what we learned, what we found so fascinating is that it is an extreme team sport, actually, where so many people come together to make that happen. And actually, the driver is almost the most expendable. If the driver starts to not do well, then they quickly get shuffled around to find a better driver. And so really what's happening with the race day is like leading up to that, the team had to, construct, had to design, research, construct their own car. That right there blew my mind when I realized that. Imagine a hockey team tasked with the responsibility of designing their own skates and their own sticks and everything ahead of time. But that's what the Formula One teams have to do. 
And then on race day, so many people come together to make that happen. You've got a line of people who are communicating with the driver, strategizing, telling them conditions, what's coming up next. And then don't forget the pit crew. They're key. The driver has to at least two, um, one or two times, they have to switch tires. And that pit crew, a number of people there, if they don't make it happen within seconds, it can mean you know, disaster for the driver. You see some situations where they make a mistake and it's cost the driver like 10, 15 seconds. That's usually the end. <laughs> so everybody comes together to make sure that, you know, that they succeed. And when they succeed, it happens as a team. They succeed and grow and you know, win together. I see that as a great illustration of how we should view ourselves, that we're essentially part of a team. And if we grow, if things go well, if we win, we do it together. But minus that competitive part, because <laughs> I don't think that the competition part is part of the God's kingdom. But the rest of it I take as a good illustration. So I take it then that as Christians, we got a bit of work to do in this area. I know for myself as well, it's something that I need to keep reminding reimagining myself, that we need to take that pendulum and make it swing toward community in our church, in our churches, in the Christian world. And we've been kind of leading toward this in our series, I would say, especially if we think back to that week when we were picturing the church together. We saw the pictures that the, the Bible gives us of the church, uh, that the church is a family. When we become a Christian, we join the family that the church is the temple of God, and each of us as Christ followers, you know, we are a part of that temple of God, joined by the Spirit. And we saw that it's also the body of Christ, and each follower of Jesus forms a part, makes a part of that body. Each of these, at a core level, points to community for all of us. So I think the idea here is we might need to reimagine, remind ourselves, um, what the true relation of each of us is to community, to the church. What Van Gelder and Giles say is that actually to be a Christian is to be given an ecclesial identity. And that word ecclesia there simply means congregation or assembly. In other words, to be a Christian is to be given a congregation identity. Who I am now, it's, it's kind of changed. I'm now part of a group. I'm now part of a local congregation. And now who I am and kind of who I'm becoming is wrapped up in that congregation. People are meant to really impact me through the power of the Spirit, all centered around Jesus. I've got a church identity, so to speak. Now, this might be sounding scary to some. It might be exciting to some. I get that. We're going to come back to that in a little while. But here's what Paul says about this. He says in Romans 12, 4 to 5, For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. That part is so important to me. Becoming a Christian, things have changed. I'm not, I shouldn't think of myself as independent, as isolated. I now belong, we belong to one another. We are all kind of together in this. It's togetherness over kind of singleness, so to speak. Community over kind of thinking of myself as, like I said, isolated, independent. And I like the way, I want to read the message translation of this. It puts it really vividly <laughs> for us. It says, we are like the various parts of a human body. Each part gets it, its meaning from the body as a whole, not the other way around. That's powerful when you think about it. Because we often think of ourselves as like, okay, I'm developing my own meaning, and then I'm going to bring that to the group, and we're going to kind of put those together but this is saying it's the other way around, that I get my meaning from the group, from the community. And to go, it goes on, the body we're talking about is Christ's body of chosen people. Each of us finds our meaning and function as a part of his body. But 
I like this part. As a chopped off finger or a cut off toe, we wouldn't amount to much, would we? This is pointing at this idea that now the church, the body of Christ, it's essential <laughs> to who I am at a deep level. I find meaning, identity in my relationship to Christ's body, the church. In other words, I'm kind of discovering now the project is different. I'm discovering who I am in the context of relationship, of the congregation, of community. As I serve and love others, and as others love me and, and speak into my life, I'm discovering now who I am, my new identity in Christ. Maybe a better way of putting it as we are all together discovering our community identity together in Christ through the Spirit. Now again, that might be scary for some. <laughs> it might be exhilarating. But it's actually Jesus' prayer for all of us. In John 17, 21 to 23, Jesus prays these words. I am not praying only on behalf of the, his current disciples, but also on behalf of those who believe in me through their testimony, that they will all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. I pray that they will be in us so that the world will believe that you sent me. That's just reading 21. I invite you to read the rest of it there as well, where he goes on. But you see there, that prayer is for oneness, that prayer is for community, that we would have a kind of community with each other that resembles the Trinity, that we are in that kind of relationship with the Trinity and with each other through the Spirit. Now, the interesting thing about this, just one more point before we conclude. Did you notice how at the end of it there, he's adding something, he's adding kind of the purpose of this. He says that he prays that we would be one, just like he and his father are one, so that the world will believe you sent me, he says. Our oneness, our community, identity, all of that stuff is meant to say something. It's meant to point to Jesus. It's meant to witness to Jesus. And you might remember back to one of our early weeks where we talked about the purpose of the church, that our big purpose is to be a witness to Jesus and that the Holy Spirit, bring in that quote from earlier, right? The Holy Spirit's trying to say something through us. The Holy Spirit's trying to communicate Jesus through us. And we also talked about in a couple weeks back that the Holy Spirit wants to create God's character in us. He wants us to resemble God. He wants to us to resemble Jesus. So you bring all that together and you realize then just how key our ecclesial identity is in all of this. How key our togetherness is, our unity, all of those things. Through our love for one another, in other words, through our unity, through our deep valuing of community, the Spirit wants to say to people, here's Jesus. And also beyond that, the Spirit wants to communicate God's desire for all people, that, that all people would be part of his community and in communion with him. So at the end of the day, we're talking about living out the gospel message. That's pretty powerful stuff. But that's the project, so to speak. When we talk about our personal project, that's my personal project, but it's tied into the community. It's tied into the community project. It's all kind of coming together. Okay, so I'm going to finish off with that. And I wonder where you're at now, as I've said all these things. You might be having trouble kind of catching the excitement here on this. Maybe this will help. If I think back through my life, and I think about the times when I've felt most alive, most like myself, I realize it's when I was in a community that was functioning this way. Uh, a community where I really knew that I belonged, 
a community where people loved me and I loved them, a community that God and Jesus were really at the center. So I've kind of found this to be true in my own life as well. But this may still trigger a lot of fear, for example. Because let's face it, community can be this amazing thing, but it can also be the source of deep hurt and pain. And I've been there. I know what it's like to be hurt by a community as well, or those within a community. And here's the thing. There's a principle that I've learned. I can't, I'm not sure exactly where I've learned. I think it was from Plato, but I'm not sure. I can't remember back. But it's this, that the most powerful things in life have the potential for great good, but also great pain, great hurt. I mean, take a simple example, Superman, right? He is extremely strong, nearly indestructible. Used for good, he is amazing. He does incredible things if you watch the movies and all of that, right? But you can imagine if he turned bad, it would be a nightmare. Well, the same is true of relationships. The same is true of community. They can be extremely life-giving or they can be very hurtful and life-draining. But I think that that's why it's important to talk about this today, to reimagine ourselves in light of community, in relation to community. Because if we kind of catch this vision, we kind of realize how core it is and how much that's God's desire for us, then when we're hurt by community, when we're hurt by someone in community, it helps for us to have maybe a different um, reaction to it, so to speak, you know, where we realize, okay, but the goal is still togetherness. The goal is still the community. The goal is reconciliation. It's restoration, forgiveness, rather than kind of splintering off, segregating off, and dividing, and all of that. Now, I'm realizing, as I'm saying this, right there, I think it would be a good idea to have, like, a full-out peer group discussion on it, maybe even another sermon, because we're not trying to oversimplify here. If you've been hurt by someone, this isn't about sweeping it under the rug, because good community, a Christ-centered community, doesn't just sweep problems under the rug. The Christ-centered community is all about sticking up for the vulnerable, sticking up for and, you know, preventing and fighting against injustice, and it's all about, you know, loving and really bringing out the best for all of us. So we're not saying that here. It's just more, this helps us to have this, this goal in mind, knowing that for our part, we want to do all that we can to work toward this ecclesial identity, this togetherness, this community-mindedness. And I bring this up today because I think about where we're at right now. We're actually in a place where we can finally start to think about getting together <laughs> again. If these phases go according to plan, then hopefully by the end of June into July, we at the pier will be able to have some outdoor services. And also we'll be able to start seeing each other at parks, in our backyards, and those sorts of things. So I feel like this is a good time to remember and to, to reflect, maybe even reimagine ourselves in relation to community so that kind of we enter into this new time with that priority in mind, with that outlook in mind, with that understanding in mind. So I think that that's key for us to hear today, right? I've said that we aren't at our core isolated, independent individuals on these separate projects. Actually, God's desire is that we are together on a project of discovering who we are in Christ, in the Spirit, that we are all at a core level connected in that way. Our identity comes from each other. We belong and we are loved in that way. And God kind of wants the church to be leaders in that regard, to be a light in that regard. And I think about it, right? Online has been great and there's so much to it. But as we move into a time when we can be together, that's even better. To be together in person is even better. <laughs> so let's prioritize, as we go into the summer, let's prioritize being together. Let's prioritize building into each other 
and loving each other. Okay, thanks for being together today. This has been awesome. I just want to pray for us um, before we go into one more song together. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, we just thank you so much um, for today. And uh, I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are always, you know, always with us and that we can lean on you in hard times, that, you, that we know that you are deeply with us. And I just thank you for this reminder today, this reminder to maybe have um, a new imagination around ourselves in relation to community. Please, please just help us, Holy Spirit. Create in us a deep desire to help each other, to be there for each other. Create in us a desire to be together and to prioritize community. Help us to, you know, when push comes to shove, to work toward reconciliation. Help us to work toward restoration, to work toward togetherness and all of that, Lord Jesus. You know where we're at. I thank you that uh, the peer, um, that I know that we are on track with this, that we do care a lot about each other. And I know that's the thing. We really miss seeing each other. So I thank you for the opportunities that are to come. And I just pray that you would build that togetherness in us, that ecclesial identity in us more and more in the weeks and months to come so that we could even be to a point where people look and see you, Jesus, and desire to be a part of that because I think that's all of our, your desire for all of us to be in your community, loved, knowing that we are loved by you, knowing that we are your children and with the gift of your spirit. So it's in your name, Jesus, I pray these things. Amen.
presence, your Holy Spirit will dwell in us. God, that your face will shine upon us and you'll never stop showing us who you are, more of who you are, God. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen, Peer family. Have an amazing week and we will see you next Sunday. You hold the reins on the
valleys below with the breath of your mighty wings. All treasures of wisdom and things to be known are hidden inside of your hand. And in this fortunate turn of events, you ask me to be your friend. Ask me to be your friend In you, you are my first You are my last You are my future In my past In you, you are my first Treasures of wisdom and things to be known are hidden inside of your head. And in this fortunate turn of events, you ask me to be your friend. You ask me to be your friend. Sing it this morning. Yeah. 